Okay, line myself up a little better there. Right on time. Let's, um, let's start with our usual protocol of uh, fellowship. 30 seconds of quiet time to bring yourself back into fellowship if there's anything between you and the Lord. Or to just uh, petition for understanding and grasping of the great doctrines uh, that God will the Holy Spirit will present. Let's start with 30 seconds. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray for your blessing on this time that we're together in your word. Help us to understand these great uh, mysteries, these great doctrines in their deepest sense. And that is the sense in which you gave them to us, uh, the sense of the deepness of, of uh, your person. I pray, Lord, um, that we take these doctrines that we learn and to make them our own and to establish them in our souls that we may use them for... Um, for comparing and contrasting, and for obedience. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we are, where are we? We are in, we Sunday, July the 10th, um, uh, 2022, and we're in Galatians chapter 4. We're going to be finishing up the verse 5. And hopefully doing 6, 7, and 8. Doesn't sound like a big task, does it? <laughs> and then that will have, this comes with 8, I believe. But um, we'll go into that piece. So <clears throat> I'm going to read verse 5 here, even though I don't have it up there. It's from last week, just so we get an orientation to the, um, to the verses, to, to the completing of that verse. And it says, um, To redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. Uh, and if you remember, the word might there is a subjunctive, which means that it's potential. Maybe yes, maybe no, depending on our um, volition. So if, uh, and the redeeming part um, is uh, to redeem for the purpose of the cross, of course. And under the law in this case, and we'll see this in a couple of verses, that this law is not just talking about the Mosaic law, but the law that in fact the world works from, and in, in some cases, divine establishment. And in re believers uh, actually fall into that. And um, also for the laws that uh, actually established by even pagan religions, as the Galatians had. So um, let's jump onto the verses that support this part. And uh, the first one we have left over is, um, is Romans 10.4 and then First John. So we'll read Romans 10.4 first. And I have a title for this, that, that call, uh, Christ is the culmination of the law. So this is what that hat, first piece of this. And the culmination means, uh, culmination it means to, uh, to be its final product. And uh, I think we've talked about that enough, but in reality I don't want you to get the verse confused, that the culmination here is talking about its completion and final product that is done with, and we've talked about that, that occurs on the cross, and we've found that from the other verses. It says, so the culmination of law, so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. And that uh, if, that actually is a, an if there, and that righteousness comes with faith in Christ, right? We know that. So there's nothing prior to that. There was no righteousness in the law. All there was was condemnation. So that, that part where it says there may be is a choice, right? For those who, and this is kind of a backward sentence in my mind, it says, there may be righteousness for everyone who believes, but in reality, those who believe have righteousness. Okay, so you kind of look at forward and backwards. So that was the purpose of the law, as you see here in this sentence, in this verse, where it says, the culmination of law, period, so that there may be, through faith, righteousness. That's how you should look at it. And that confirms everything we've been looking at, from, uh, from the point of view of doctrine. And then we kind of leap to the second part of this sentence where we might be adopted as sonship, 
adopted through sonship is in the John 1, 12 through 13. And this is the new creation, new creature, born of God. And this is an important thing for us to understand because sometimes we don't grasp the demarcation point, and that's kind of the, the pole, the, the stake in the sand between Judaism and, um, and Christianity, which, is, which Galatians is all about, trying to sort these two out. And uh, many times I think, a lot like you and like we've mentioned, I think I've, carried, I've said this every week, you would think this would be a simple subject. In fact, you know, the first thing you want to do is say, would you stop talking about that? I already got this thing. Why do you keep repeating this stuff? And he's not really repeating it. What he's really trying to do for us who follow it, and I'm talking about who follow it, if you just listen to this thing and you don't really spend time thinking about what it says and reviewing the verses, what happens is that you don't dig. That's what happens. It's like you, you end up being a surface dweller. You, know, you end up being the person who, who flies on the top of verses and think you have the uh, profoundness that God has given you. And if you're one of those people, in reality, um, you, you do not understand God because the understanding of God comes from the, the digging. It comes from the understanding of what God really meant. If this stuff were simple, it, 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 anybody could do it. But we know from 1 Corinthians chapter 2 that in reality it is the spiritual man who understands these. And the spiritual man is not just one because he is saved, because there's another verse to that. We know the people who call the, uh, the sukikos man, not the sukikos man, the sukikos man, <coughs> the fleshly man, who is actually a believer too. But he doesn't understand the Word of God. And, and that's really the reality of what we're running into now. One of the struggles the church is having today and why it's such a wreck is because it doesn't understand these verses, these first verses that were written uh, thousands of years ago. And so to dig into them is to understand the, the fundamental nature of the provision that God has given us to live the most powerful life of any believer in history. And that's the part the church doesn't get. It, 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 it falls under the, and, and, and Jeannie and I were talking about this earlier, it falls under the thing that if I'm nice and I'm sweet, I therefore have met God's principles, and that's what Christians are supposed to do. That lie is from the pit of hell. That is Satan's point of view. And you know that, I feel like I'll wait for you to hear it, you know that because that's what unbelievers do. Unbelievers are nice and sweet. They want Christians to be nice and sweet, okay? And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with being nice and sweet. I'm just telling you that it's a result of, of walking the Christian life. It's not the goal. We're not to be nice and sweet because there's plenty of times where Jesus is not nice and sweet. There's plenty of times where we know that Paul is not nice and sweet. So it would violate that as a doctrine, and they don't violate it. Jesus doesn't violate his doctrine, neither does Paul. In reality, nice and sweet is never the goal of Christianity. It is in reality walking to the truth, walking in the Holy Spirit, and choosing to have the attitude of Christ kind of comes with it when you choose those two. But in reality, that's the Christian life. And then things result from that. Service to the Lord results from that. Okay, So that is our goal. And uh, God is the one who brings things into our life to help us to fully... Um, manifest that, to fully manifest Christ in, in, in our lives. And um, well, we're, I'm really excited about reading some. I want to get about two weeks in advance here uh, because I'm really excited about some piece where uh, Paul has this problem uh, with his eye and how uh, it shows that the, the eye itself, he has this issue with it, stops his missionary journey right where it's at. And um, in reality, it looks grotesque on him. His eyes are all swollen. He looks kind of like a cyclops. And he has this big ugly thing. And we'll, we'll get into that. But what I like about it is it, it clearly sits there and says, you know something? something? Sometimes when something bad happens to you, it's God working that bad so you to work something divine. And we all often look like look at that. We look at something like, oh, that hurt. Oh, 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 oh. how could God do this to me? You know, it's like, okay, you know something? Reality is that, yeah, I know I gave you cancer, but you're supposed to be in the hospital because there's all these people who need to be saved. And you have a chance to have eternal significance. 
Uh, but by the way, I want you to make sure that you remind me of this class, should that happen to me. <laughs> but um, all joking aside, in reality, the, the, uh, John 1, 12 through 13, is a new creation and a new creature born of God. And that's who we are. That's why we are so different from the law. So the people who try to pursue the law are absolutely morons. And they are morons because that life is not offered in any part of the law, ever. Not the Jews in the, in the time of, of uh, Judaism or the time of Israel. It only is offered to Christianity. Okay? So it says, um, Yet to all who receive him, that's salvation, and to those who believe in his name. Now the na word name here is nomos. It means person in this case. It means faith in Christ. Okay? He gave <clears throat> the right, this is God the Father, the he in here, gave the right, to become children of God. Okay, that's what we've been talking about. Now John uses the word technon for this, but in the case of, of uh, Paul, he uses the word weos, and like we've talked about, that means mature uh, of inheritable age, and the reasons he uses that word, and, and John doesn't, is John is talking, John is not making a case for Christianity. Okay, he's not. And that's what Paul is doing, which is why we make a big issue of the, of the we ask, the adoption, the inheritance, because that's the subject of this whole thing here. Uh, and John, he doesn't do that. He's just talking about the children of God, which in reality is the we ask of God, because in Christianity, there's nothing else. And we'll run into that as we go through each one of these verses that follows. Um, so he says, children, and this is how he's very specifically, understanding how we are children, it says, uh, children born not of natural descent. Okay, That means there's no biology point to it. This is both a reflection back to what we've been talking about. The Jews uh, being the very uh, the seed of Abraham, which is a lie. Uh, they are a physical seed, which means nothing. Now, I hate to break it to you. This is the part that we understand that in reality, the physical relationship that we have with others, meaning that they're our family, uh, does not in any way make them greater than the spiritual relationship we have with them from God. Matter of fact, the one that you have from God will last for eternity. The ones that you have biologically to your family will only last as long as, as we're alive. After that, they're done. Um, so it's important to put that stuff in right perspective. It's, then it says, nor of human decision or a husband's will. Uh, then that means the, the husband's desire for his wife to make children. And he's, he's making a contrast here. And then he says, but born of God. Now there's a really interesting piece here, is that if you look at us, and I've mentioned this before, if you look at us, the, the, the real picture of this is that Jesus Christ, when he was born, his father was God the Father. In reality, actually making that part of the DNA for the Virgin Mary to be uh, impregnated, to become pregnant, and to have the Christ, Jesus. Um, and he was born of God. He is the only son of God by birth, by true birth. Okay? We are adopted. Okay? In, in the adoption, we'll talk more about that, but you've heard it a million times. We are adopted and born of God. So, reality, we have the same place. Okay, and I don't mean that we're God. That's the stupidest thing. Only Mormons believe that kind of rubbish. Okay, uh, but in reality, we have the standing of that. That's our standing, and that is our eternal reality. Because when this stuff is all done, all there'll be is eternal reality. See, we have things backwards. We think that what you touch and you feel is the real as real as going to be. But in reality, the things that are spiritual of God are the things that last for eternity. Forever and ever. A hundred billion years from today, uh, we barely, we'll have perfect memory, so we will remember. But the joke is that it really won't have any significance to us anymore. Okay? But the spiritual side, that part of the resurrection body, the spiritual bodies that we will be given, that will be like Christ, will be time immemorial. Forever and ever and ever. The only reality that matters. Okay? So it grasp that. But that's what it's talking about here. So, let's get on to the principles, so we can summarize this. And, um, principles are, 
Um, this is by Kenneth Weiss. He says, uh, mankind was a child before Christ came. And he's talking about pre-Christianity. Okay? In reality, uh, that child was the technon we've talked about. But I wanted to quote it here so we actually see that other great you know, scholars, many people who, are, who have known these things for hundreds of years ago, in reality, they have been lost to us um, in Christianity because those scholars are no longer used. But it's always interesting to me, um, I find that many of the things that are 150 years old by scholars that were a long time ago have a greater truth and reality than I find spoken in the church anywhere by any theologians, any, anywhere on any place that I see them. And it's very, it, what it tells me is that God is consistent and that God's truth is true and it transcends time. And those who sometimes were five or six hundred years ago understand God better than we do today. Okay. And I think that's, to me, that's you know, pragmatically obvious by the mess that the church is in. They obviously understood God better than we do uh, because they were able to lead people to a stronger and truer life uh, uh, in Christ. Um, now this is, I'm going to make this statement here, um, and it's the one that bothers everybody. So everybody gets bothered by this when you start talking about grace. Um, what's the joke? Uh, everybody loves grace when it's applied to them, but not to others. Okay? And so, uh, I'm okay because I know me and God knows me, and I'm, I'm really glad God saved me. He knew all my stuff were just minor infractions, and gee, I deserve that, you know? But those people who are really wicked, they don't deserve it. Well, we know that's a lie. But the whole thing right here is that uh, this piece here where it says there is no legal system that exists for Christians. Okay, and I'm not talking to you that you disobey the law. I'm talking about the law with respect to the things that God has given to us. Does that mean that God does not give us guidelines? Let me tell you why that's true, okay? It's because when you are a weos, when you're an adult son, as a parent, you don't go around telling your adult son what to do, right? You can give them advice, you can tell them what's true, and whether they obey it or not is up to them. That's where we're at. Okay? That's why Christians want to keep the law. See, they want to say, no, you have to have some guidance. You have to have good and bad. You have to have obedience. You have to... What's that sound? That's legalism. Okay? Now, grace is even scarier than that because grace sits there and says, uh, I presented the truth to you. Do, with you. do what you need to do. And it's that scary. Uh, that's scary because we're afraid that somehow Christians are going to have, are going to be licentious. They're going to be, have sexuality and they're going to break laws and stuff like that. Uh, you know, that, that's kind of ludicrous. And I'll tell you why it's ludicrous is because uh, Christians already do that. Yeah, lots of Christians. We have lots of Christians who do stuff like that. That stuff is creeping into the church. Um, in reality, what, what it means is that we are to graciously do what the Lord asks us to do under grace because we love him because we know him, because we want to be in his plan. Just like we chose to be in salvation by believing in Christ, so we walk in the Christian life the same way. That's why you have so many Christians who don't walk like Christians. They're, they're, they walk like heathens. In reality, if you ask them to come to Sunday or read the Bible more than once, you're asking, oh, oh, I can't find the time. Can't find time. Or worse yet is that, oh God, I read my 15 verses today. I am spiritual. I am on target with God. And I'm singing the songs all the way to work. Jesus loves me. You know, all that stuff. That's not Christianity. Yet, it poses as Christianity and it is actually predominant in Christianity today. That's not Christianity. It's not. Christianity is walking in the Holy Spirit. It's walking because you desire when you walk in the Holy Spirit to be Christ-like and to be like Him and to take the advice of God the Father through the Word of God. And you choose it over yourself. That's Christianity. So even though we don't have a law, a Christian who loves the Lord and knows Him, because that's why He loves them, in reality chooses even the smallest little infractions to stay away from. Not, not even what they do or what they say, but what they think. And they don't choose it for legalism. They choose it because they love their Lord. Now, do they wrestle with it sometimes? Yeah, we all have sin natures. But we all know that we can control the sin nature through the power of the Holy Spirit. We talked about that two weeks ago. 
So this part right here, I want you to remember this, and it is the part that everybody will shut this thing down and never listen to another class I have, is that there is no legal system for Christians. There is no legality. It is only grace. The Christian life is grace. It is a powerful, supernatural life that God has provided in grace. It's not you. You're not nice. In reality, you're a sinner like everybody else. But God has provided this because you are, in fact, a new creation and a new creature. And God has provided you the provision to the filling of the Holy Spirit to allow you to live that life. It's a grace operation. You have to choose it. And why do you know you have? This is the part about the legal system. A legal system says, if you don't do it, I'm going to punish you. Grace tells you that if you live that life, you will please and you will glorify my Lord and God. That's the difference between the two. That's why the Galatians 5.23 says, there is no law in such things. That, and that's talking about the fruits of the Spirit. When you walk in the fruits of the Spirit, which is the filling of the Spirit, in reality, you exceed all laws. The, the, the Mosaic law is down here, and the one required of us is infinitely higher. So the contrast here, in this verse here, uh, the old contract of the Mosaic Law is abrogated, that means repealed, and is no longer in force. In reality, the church would have no legalism and no Ten Commandments other than as a reference to how they lived before and how they were condemned by those things and were cursed until Christ came. That was its purpose. Remember, it is to make sinfulness to, to be its true sinfulness, to show how sinfulness is deeply, deeply sinful, which is something that's hard for us to grasp. It's hard for us to grasp because in reality, we all, we all speak sin nature. We all speak flesh. We were, we were, we were in that world forever. That's how we're, all of us came. Nobody came the other way except for Christ. <clears throat> so in reality, that is abrogated. And the new contract is grace. The new contract after the death of Christ and the abrogation of the law and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, grace came in as the way in which we live, which is what, which is what Galatians is all about. It is the Christian spiritual life. There's not a second way. So you're either living it by, the, by those principles or you're not living it and you're not glorifying God and you cannot actually help God in, his, in the battle against the world and against the, the, uh, the evil of Satan. Um, this is from R.B. Theme. I have to sometimes write down who they are because uh, you know, what happens is you, when you thoroughly read them all, they become part of you. you know, when you understand what they're saying, they become part of you. And, and so I have to make a little notes here who, who I read it from when I'm going to speak it um, so that you actually know where it came from. <clears throat> now this is a really great thing and I just talked about it a minute ago. At least I referred to it. I don't know if you got it. But it says, Heirs uh, come through sonship, okay, the subject of this. There's no other way. If you are not a son, you have no rights to the inheritance, okay? And there's only two ways to be a son and to be an heir. One is to be born that way, Jesus Christ, and the other is to be adopted, that's us. That's us, and it is the church, okay? This doctrine is church doctrine. The Jews' inheritance, if you look at it, and they did have an inheritance, but it was all earthly, right? That's refreshing, just I'll give you a couple words. The Mosaic Law, in reality, had <clears throat> the Abrahamic Covenant, they had the Palestinian Covenant, they had the Davidic Covenant, and if you're familiar with those are, we've talked about that's the Davidic sea, is the crown ship, that's what, that was Jewish, that's not ours. It's not that, that's, that's their side. That's their inheritance. Their inheritance is the Abrahamic one. Okay, we know that. We actually have some heirship in that when we come to believe because we become the seeds of, of Abraham and the seeds of Christ through faith. And then you have the Palestinian, which is the land. Okay, we have no earthly promises, right? We're citizens of heaven. You know that verse. Okay, but, that, but the ones that were prior to the death, part of the Mosaic Law, and part of the Abrahamic covenant was the Palestinian covenant. It was actually pre-law, but it belonged to them. It does not belong to us. We don't have that airship, just like they don't have airship to us. In reality, the Jews will have their airship, and they're talking about places like Daniel chapter 12. <clears throat> they're, they're very, very specific, but they don't have ours. Neither do we have theirs. All of our airship 
is heavenly. Okay? Meaning that we're citizens of heaven and the airship we have is directly related to that of Jesus Christ. Okay? The resurrected Christ. So this is an important thing to remember that um, this does not apply to anybody before. This is specifically Christian doctrine. How do we know it's Christian doctrine? It's written in the Christian epistles. Okay? It, it, it's kind of like <clears throat> the same thing we talk about. You know, if, if I tell my wife we're going out to dinner, I don't expect you guys to show up. Right? <laughs> because it's out of context for you to show up and have dinner. Although you might be invited, but probably not. So let's go to the next verse. Understand context. And that is verse 6. <clears throat> so, um, this one says, um, this, this is some really neat stuff in this thing. It says, because you are his sons, okay, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts. The spirit who calls out Abba, Father. Now, believe it or not, there's an awful lot of stuff in here. Okay, one of the things that happens with a prepositional phrase right here is that uh, you, you, can, you can move it. Actually, I don't think that's a preposition. I think it's a, con a conjunction. So it would be a conjunctive clause. But you can move it. Okay, so look what it says there. It says, because you are his sons, note that piece, because of that, God, the Father, sent the Spirit, let's just stop it there for a second, the Holy Spirit was sent to you and given to you because you are His sons. So what does that tell us? It also tells us the proof that we are the very sons of God is the presence of the Holy Spirit in us. That's a, and, and we'll find out later that that is actually a guarantee of the sonship. It's a down payment. Because we have not moved from where we are today to the, the, to the consummation of that, which would be the rapture and the, um, <clears throat> you know, the resurrection body and all that part like that. It's called, it's called ultimate sanctification. Because that has not taken place, God gave us his spirit showing us that we are sons. So when I see the Holy Spirit work in my life, when I, and I do, and when I see him give me insight to things that are in the scriptures, when I watch him, both looking back at my life and in my present life, I know for a fact that this verse is fulfilled that I am an actual son of God because he gave me his Holy Spirit and it is present in my life. And this is also uniquely a Christian verse. The Jews have none of this. Okay? And so this is why it's important is that when you, when, you, when you really understand the context of the New Testament, the epistles specifically, not the Gospels, we've talked about that, um, when we understand the, the epistle doctrine uh, specifically, we can go back and look at the Old Testament, and we can look at it, and what we should be saying is that, where's all this stuff? Where's the Holy Spirit in all this stuff? Where's the sons of God? Where, where is this hard stuff that he occupied? Where, where is this calling up? Because it's not there. Now, I'll tell you what happens. Because the church teaches it one big swoop, we make the mistake of understanding that their stuff is our stuff. And our stuff is their stuff. But there couldn't be a greater lie than that. Okay? And this is the part about context. This is very specific, spoken to the Galatians in Christianity. And the absence of this in the Old Testament doctrine is a further uh, credibility that it only belongs to Christians. Okay? That's how you tell. Okay? The problem is that most people, <laughs> I listened to Jeannie and some of her friends in her class, Oh, they're so funny. <laughs> if it weren't pathetic, it'd be funny. But part of it is, is that how could they possibly put this stuff together when they can't tell Moses from Noah? Okay? They just, they just don't know it. So uh, this is the part in the scripture in Hosea 4, 6 where it says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Your lack of knowledge about who God is and doctrines will destroy your life, personally and individually. But when you put all of us together like the churches today, and you have massive ignorance of the doctrines, what are you going to get? Discipline. Destruction. What do you see today in the church? Discipline. Destruction. And that actually carries out even to the society that we're in, the United States of America, and other countries who have Christians, for that very reason. Okay? Stability stands on the presence of God in our lives and when the world doesn't have that stability, it's crazy, okay? It's crazy. You just have to look, read a newspaper, turn the news on. It won't take you long to be unstable because that's what the world is. The world's unstable, okay? It's unstable because it doesn't have the Lord. 
So we have this piece here that tells us very simply that this is the guarantor here. This is why God sent it. We'll find it in other verses as we go through here. Uh, that in reality, this is the down payment. It's kind of like, uh, it's kind of like uh, I look at it like this time. It's kind of like God gives you a gold coin. Okay, let's just use that as an example. And he asks you to put it in his pocket. Okay, put it in your pocket. And whenever, if, if the Lord were to come to you personally and take that gold coin and say, okay, whenever you get afraid, Rich, I want you to take this coin out and look at it. My picture's on it. Okay, and it's your guarantee that when you die, I'll be there to pick you up. And that all the things that you do, I will reward you for those things. So put it in your pocket, keep it, and whenever you're afraid, just pick it out and look at it and go, oh yeah, I remember the day he gave this to me. Okay? That's the Holy Spirit. That's why it's so important to walk with him. He protects us. He is the very power of God to protect us even from ourselves. He is the power of God that allows us to do God things to do divine things, to be part of the divine work. And we know from Scripture that God does not allow human beings to do His work. They allow them to be agents, agents of the power of God. That's what we have. But we only have that in fellowship, and we only have that in submission, just like our, the author and perfecter of our faith, Jesus Christ. <clears throat> so that part in our hearts is right here. This is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. This is where we interface. And that word in here, hearts, is go, oh, heart, heart, No, no, no. In the scriptures, we know this, and we all know this, right? But some people don't. Is that the heart, the cardia, heart, okay, Greek word heart, cardiologist, right? That heart right there is the pumping pump. That's all it does. Whenever the scriptures talk about it, it's never talking about the pump, okay? We need the pump, but it's not significance. Uh, in, in our spiritual lives. This heart is talking about the quintessence of your soul. That little piece of, it's like the ram of your soul. It's the part that's active in consciousness. And it's the quintessence of it where you make all your decisions. And that is where the Holy Spirit interfaces with us. Okay? He interfaces. Okay? Now right here, just so you know, we'll get into it in verse. The Spirit of His Son is talking about the Holy Spirit. This is just one of the functional, it's called a functional title. Okay? But the Holy Spirit, as you know this stuff from doctrine, that the Holy Spirit always is in reality the Spirit of His Son. He was sent before by Christ. He prophesied that. And, he would, and the Holy Spirit would never say anything other than what Christ told Him to do. And He instructs us. That's all in the Scriptures. That's exactly what Jesus tells us that He will do. So this is just a functional title. You'll see it in other places. I'll read some to you in a minute. Uh, into our heart. He's the interface, unique to Christianity. And then it says, the Spirit, and I like this part, the Spirit, that's the, uh, uh, that's called the subject, who calls, this is a relative pronoun, but we can take that out, who calls out Abba Father. Isn't that interesting? It is the Holy Spirit in us who calls out Abba Father. Okay? And now, we, we know from the, the verse here that this, this is actually two verses. This is the word, this word, this word right here, you know what the big Greek word for this is? Abba. <laughs> okay? Uh, what is it? It's Abba. Now you speak Aramaic, right? But that's what it is. It's Abba. It's transliterated so we can say it, but it's an Aramaic word. And Aramaic is just a, uh, it's a between language um, that came out of the captivity uh, of, uh, between Hebrew and Chaldean. So it's just kind of the a middle word there, but that's what they spoke. And Jesus spoke that, and that's what they spoke, spoke in Pal uh, Palestine during the writing of this. But this is the Greek word, and the Greek word is pater. We're familiar with words like that, very, uh, very specifically. But in this context here, this reaches back to us to help us understand that this is a, this is a name of intimacy. Okay? Uh, let me give you an example. Okay? Is that my sons and daughters can call me dad, okay? But other people don't call me dad. Why? Because they don't have a relationship with me. I'm not their dad, okay? But they have a specific relationship with me that is a, um, an intimate relationship with me in which I will treat them differently, okay? And the example would be, and I'm just going to use this as a joke because my kids know I won't give it to them, but if my son came up to me and said, I need $1,000, I'd say, oh, okay, here's $1,000. And why would I do this? Because he's my son. Now, the truth is, I don't give my kids a thousand dollars, but 
but let's just use it for the example. But if a stranger comes up to me and asks me for a thousand dollars, I would probably fall over laughing so hard I wouldn't know what to do. <clears throat> okay, so you see the absurdity. So this is telling us that we have this relationship. Our father is not the one who is harsh. Our father is the one who is gracious and kind and loving. And that's what it's saying here. Our relationship to the God of the universe, the creator of the universe, his brother, but there's a <clears throat> piece where the father plays part in that, but our place to the, to the, the, to the uh, Elohim, to the Jehovah, to the uh, Yahweh, is dad or daddy. We're not so young that we say daddy, but <clears throat> you get the idea. It's an intimate relationship that only we have a right to. And the Holy Spirit is the one who we speak to through Him. Because in reality, sometimes we say things that don't have the full meaning that we say with our words. <clears throat> but the Holy Spirit translates that to God the Father. Now, does that need to be done? <clears throat> no, this is a language of accommodation. In reality, if you pray a prayer today, God knew that prayer a hundred million years ago before you ever existed and before the universe was even here. Okay? So, it's a language of accommodation to help us to understand something that if I talked in reality, you'd be so confused, I'd be, I'd be confused trying to say it, okay? And I'd be confused because in reality, there's nothing that God ever learns, right? It, he's always learned it. He's always known it forever and ever and ever. If God can learn, he's not God because he doesn't know everything, okay? That's the, that's the point to remember. <clears throat> but the whole point here is that this shows us a language of accommodation, a functional mechanics that really takes place, okay, for us to understand our relationship with, with God through the Holy Spirit and why it's there. Okay, so let me see if I got all that. Um, <clears throat> yeah, there was a little piece here. I wrote, made a note here. This comes from uh, Lewis Perry Chafer. Systematic Theology, Volume 6, page 129, just if you're asking. He says here, uh, and I think this is a really important point, he says, this shows that there is no second blessing and there is no personal edification required for the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. That's an important point. Now this is, has to do with false doctrines. There's two false doctrines. One of them is you see it in Pentecost, uh, Pentecostals. <clears throat> sometimes, not always, but sometimes you see it as one of those is that, okay, oh, you don't speak in tongues? Oh, you haven't had the second blessing yet. And this is the part that, you know, you haven't really, you haven't really reached it, you know. But Weos tells us that that's not true, right? Weos tells us, sons here, that in reality, it's all done. Okay, uh, but the other part here that he's talking about here is that there, that there isn't a requirement for a person to be uh, perfectly good and mature before they have the Holy Spirit acted as a power in their life. In reality, we know from Romans 8, and I think we'll probably get to it somewhere, is that if you don't have the Spirit, you're not of God. You're not saved. Okay? Um, so, but this, when you look at that backwards, what he's saying here, when he talks about this verse, is this verse makes it very clear that we are, because we are sons, we have the Holy Spirit, end of conversation, period, end. Okay? We, there's nowhere to go. Okay, that doesn't mean spiritual sanctification. Uh, uh, experiential sanctification means growing in maturity is not real. It is. But you get the Holy Spirit from the very moment that you're saved. Okay? <clears throat> so there is no second blessing. There is no personal sanctification that is required um, of the person who moves to have the Holy Spirit. Those are two doctrines that are false doctrines. And this verse happens to be one of them that's very clear that that's not true because it tells us very straightforward because you, you're his sons God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts and the spirit see, it's, it's ours at the moment of salvation so um, sometimes when you hear that stuff it is important to understand that the Holy Spirit has been given to all who were saved now does that mean it's always active? no, we've already talked about that we know that when people sin in reality they grieve the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit breaks that fellowship with God, meaning time fellowship, not positional fellowship. You don't lose your salvation. But in reality, at that point, when you regard sin in your heart, you are no longer operationally able to do divine stuff. Why? Because you read the Holy Spirit and that fellowship is broken with God. 
hopefully that all made sense. Um, the word here sent, when, he, when it says here, uh, interesting enough, is the word, uh, it's the same word to be sent on a mission. We ran into that word like, like three or four verses ago. It's the exact same word, to be sent on a mission. God sent the Holy Spirit on a mission. Um, the title of Son of, uh, Son of the Spirit is actually in 8-9, we'll read it. <clears throat> so let's read it for a second. Let me see if I have anything else. Oh, and I already said this, but I'll say it again. Um, the Spirit is our token of sonship. So it's kind of like the gold coin we have in our pocket. Um, the, uh, Romans 8, 9 says, um, my title for this verse is, we are of the Spirit and not of the realm of the flesh. If you're saved, that's what this says, okay? You, however, this is Romans 8, 9, you, however, are not in the realm of the flesh. Now, what he's saying there, he's not saying that you don't have flesh. He's not saying that you're not human. He means that you do not, you no longer belong to the old sin nature in its operational sense, okay? Like the world. He says, but you are in the realm of the spirit. See, we live a spiritual life. Does that mean we have flesh? We still have flesh as long as we're here on earth, right? And that's a whole other theology conversation. <clears throat> and it says, if... Indeed, the Spirit of God lives in you. So that's a question, okay? Hopefully you got all that together. He says, I'll read it again because that's a pivotal piece here. He says, uh, you, however, are not of the realm of the flesh, but are, are in the realm of the Spirit. We are spiritual beings. We are new creations, okay? If, indeed, the Spirit of God lives in you. See, that's the part that tells us. If the Spirit of God does not live in you, then in reality, you are still of the flesh, you are not of the spiritual side, and you're part of the world because you're not saved. Okay? And then it says here, right after it, it, it gives us kind of the first one's the punch, second one's the, the second punch. Okay? And it says, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, see, that's a functional title for the Holy Spirit. If you do not have the Holy Spirit, they do not belong to Christ. See, this is, this is the confirmation of both what Chafer said and what this verse says. Is that, in reality, the, the, the way that you have the Holy Spirit function in your life as a Christian, you have Him indwelling, the goal is to have Him filling. Which means, and the difference between those is indwelling every believer has, but not every believer is filled by the Holy Spirit. And you are filled by the Holy Spirit when you are without sin, meaning that that sin has been, been confessed. <coughs> Excuse me, 1 John 1, 9. Um, uh, the words here, uh, let me see. No, actually, I've, I've, I've already given you enough of the words. We won't go into it. I have the word kradso, which we talked about before. It means, uh, when it says that the Holy Spirit crawls out, it's the word kradso. It means to cry, it means to uh, signifies a loud and earnest cry, which is in its, uh, by the Holy Spirit. That's shown in Matthew 9.27, Acts 14.4, Romans 9.27. It's hard to do those fast, but they're there. Um, so what we do now is we want to go to 8.15. It says, the Spirit has made this change from slaves to adults. One of the pieces that it had here. It says, the Spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, see that's the token part. You're not a slave anymore. Sometimes your mind can tell you you are because you do something stupid or because you don't feel spiritual. It doesn't change anything, okay? Uh, feelings are not the test of doctrinal accuracy or truth. Rather, the spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship. Now that's exactly, that's the made part, okay? That's the made part in this sentence. It is God the Holy Spirit who brought about in you the adoption of sonship. That's what it says here. And through that, because that is true, by Him, the Holy Spirit, we cry, Abba, Father. See, it has a parallel to Him. It's, it's, a, it's a different way of looking at it and it actually expands it in a different direction because that's what He does in Romans. <clears throat> now, the next verses here are, I call them the proof verses, okay? So we have this one. There's also Philippians 1.19, which talks about the Spirit of Jesus Christ, showing you another example of the functional title of the Holy Spirit 
having to do where he fits in the context as to what he is doing. Okay? Funk, that's what functional title means. Uh, the proof of this thing here is proof verses. And what it's really telling us here, if you look at these verses, um, and I'm just going to read uh, one of them, but look at all of them. Um, I'm going to read 1044. And what this tells us, it says, we are reconciled by the Holy Spirit, not the works of the law. Okay? This is new and it is unique to Christianity. It is unique to the Christian life and to the church and is never, ever mentioned in the Old Testament. Okay? That's why you know it's ours. Okay? It shows up in the epistles. It shows up here. Okay? And then this is, this is an example telling us, this is in the church age. It says, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. See, he, there was no law involved in it. They, remember, that's the Gentile part. Same thing is true in Acts 11, 15 through 18, and 15, 8. That's all true there. Okay? Each one of those says he was speaking the gospel message, and the Holy Spirit fell on them, just like that, meaning that it became operational. And at the time that they were in, because it was the very beginning of Christianity, the life of speaking in tongues, the life of the filling of the Holy Spirit being uh, animated was for a very specific purpose to show Peter, and it, this is what it did, to show Peter that the Gentiles could have the Holy Spirit and in reality were saved the same way and that he was on different territory. Okay, He was no longer with the Jews. In reality, this was new. Because remember, Pentecost was the Jewish had that happen to him, but it had not happened to any of the Gentiles. And I like this part where I'm just going to read the last verse uh, of Acts 11, 15 through 18. I'm going to read 18. <coughs> to, um, oh no, I'm going to read 17. It says, so God gave them the same gift, talking about the Holy Spirit. He gave us who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. He's talking about the Jews. He says, and he says to, he says, who was I, meaning Peter, the apostle, to think that I could stand in God's ways? Now, this is, first, this is Peter's first understanding that, you know, something, something's different in Kansas. There's something different here. You know, there's no law going on here. These Gentiles who we're, we are told to stay away from, we can't even go in their house. We can't even eat with them when he writes this. And God performs this miracle, okay, which actually isn't a miracle. Peter may think it is. But in reality, what God is doing here is saying, Peter, Peter, you're equal now. There's no Jews, there's no Gentiles. Now, Formulated later on, that would show up here in the book of Galatians, okay? But in reality, in reality, to Peter, he sees it. He sees it happening. And he's saying, I don't know what I just experienced, but clearly God has saved these, these Gentiles. And clearly they are filled with the Holy Spirit, just like we were on Pentecost eight years earlier. Okay? So, hopefully you got all that. Um... I won't read the rest of them, you can read these, but you'll, you'll see in each one of them, there's no law taking place here, yet the phenomena is documented by Luke in the book of Acts. And Peter sees it. He actually is a witness to it, as we've known from before. So the principles here is that, and I just want to tell you, I'm going to tell you a false principle, okay? Just so you can have some fun with it here. But it's, it's relevant to where we're at. It says, God is the father of all men. That's a lie. God the Father is not the Father of all men. Okay, this this verse here proves it to us very clearly. Okay, because you're sons, you get that He's your Father. But if you are not a son, if you are not saved, He's not your Father. And this is one of the false doctrines. It's a satanic doctrine called the doctrine of demons. In reality, you'll hear it say, and sometimes you'll hear Christians will actually say it. Oh yeah, we're all the sons of God. We're all his creatures. Now, we are his creatures. They are his creatures. We're his children, his sons. <clears throat> but in reality, God is not the father of all men. Okay? And this is that proof of it. Um, the Holy Spirit acts to make us adult sons by the second birth into God's family. That's who we are. We are second. We are, we, we are born a second time, a spiritual birth to become part of the spiritual God. Okay? What's it say there? We know this. For God is spiritual. 
and no man has seen them. We are, we are related to Him. We are unique because now not only are we human beings, but we are uniquely related and spiritually born where God Himself lives in us. Christ lives in us. The Holy Spirit lives in us. We are unique in all of history and all time. He removes us from being a, a, a minor to being an adult. And God the Father is our personal Father. And we can call Him Abba Father. And He does not discipline us other than as a very kind Father. When we watch Christians do stupid stuff, God disciplines them because He's a Father. Because He's a true Father. He uses the right amount of discipline. And hopefully they pay attention. But sometimes they don't. And He has to take the Christian home. Instead of looking at God as a judge, we can now look at Him as our loving and gracious Father. That's what this tells us. For bestowing the Holy Spirit on us is a pure act of grace. This is the proof of that. They didn't do anything. They didn't obey the law. They weren't personally self-righteous or they weren't personally sanctified. They believed and in reality they were made the sons of God. They, they were made in that relationship by bestowing the Holy Spirit on them. This is showing us and the Galatian believers, all Jews and Gentiles who are, who are under salvation, <clears throat> that we are under grace and we're not under some law. Not a law to condemn us, not a law to curse us. The fifth one here is the reconciliation between us and God was done without any works or merit. That's Ephesians 2, 8, 9. You were saved by grace and grace alone. <clears throat> In reality, these are the proofs, and they, we, we could spend many, many hours on them, but hopefully you've gotten it. Let's go to verse 7. We have just enough time to kind of read it and introduce ourselves to it. Um, so, you are, there, you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And it says child here in the translation, but the word is the word son, and it's the word huias. So I put that in there so that you know he didn't change on you, okay? And since, first class condition, which means that this since is actually an if, if and you are, which is why they translate use the word since, you are his child, again, word child's not there, it's not technon, in reality, it is huias. You are his son of adult age, okay? God has made you also, because all, want, all children who are sons in reality are heirs. He says, also, when he made you a son, he made you an heir. Okay? So that's what that piece says there. Um, it's important to look at it and dissect it so you know what it's saying to us. Now this slave here <coughs> is, a, is a word meaning that we go back up to the piece that was up here in actually five, is that... We think sometimes the context here is not just the law, but in reality is, is under a religion. In reality, think about it this way. This is the context that this word slave is talking about. It's not just talking about, it's talking about Gentile laws. In reality, the world, even though it doesn't know it, is a slave to Satan. Right? <clears throat> it's talking about that slavery. Heathenism... And heathen gods, which they, he's talking to the Galatians, so he's talking about their former heathen, and we'll get into that, their former relationship in heathen religion. In reality, they were slaves to that. They were dictated by the pagan religion that they had to do something. In reality, they were slaves to it. So what he's saying here is that in reality, <clears throat> you are no longer slaves. Both you Jews and you Gentiles and the world when you become God's child. The only way out of that slavery and to the freedom that I keep talking about, the no law, no legal system, the freedom of that is becoming a son who has the ability, an adult son of inheritable age, who has learned from his father, in reality has the opportunity to obey his father's um, scriptures, his, his rules, his principles. Okay, But as any adult son, you have the right to choose them. Um, and the if here is the first class condition, meaning not child, but singular for we us again. Uh, the airship here is that there's no merit in airship. 
born or adopted, Galatians has shown that this is God's grace. See, everything comes back to us and says what? No merit, grace. No merit, grace. Now, if I kept said that about 20 times, you'd get the entire thing of Galatians and we could toss it, right? Uh, but that's the primary lesson. And the reason it's the primary lesson is because even after 2,000 years, Christians still don't get it. Okay? They still don't get it. Um, and we already talked about the inheritance of Jews, not the same as ours. The, the, the inheritance it's talking about in this context is the, and we'll see it in the next verse, I think, that we are heirs of Christ. We are co-heirs with Christ. Um, we'll read the verses, uh, this is right time, and I want to kind of relate that. We'll read these three, three verses, and then we'll go into the principles uh, next week and uh, go into verse 8. But I think it, uh, I don't know, uh, whatever it is about it, the more I read and the deeper I get, the more excited I get, because the deeper truths that God has for us are in these verses. And the truth is that if you always understand them on the surface, if you actually don't dig deep and actually study these verses and how they relate to it, you will miss something that God has, has left open for you. The church has missed it as a whole. And we know that because there is no great emphasis on the Christian way of life, the spiritual life that is unique to Christianity itself. So let's close with prayer, and we'll come back to this uh, next week. Dearest, gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for your grace towards us. It's so hard to grasp grace. As human beings, we want to achieve, we want to have merit. We want to think that we had something to do with this. And what you're saying is that the greatest things that can be accomplished by a Christian is through grace, is not in our power, but in our choice. And that you are glorified and your son is glorified by the work he has done in us. But it's not us. It's our choosing in grace. I pray, Lord, help us to remember this this week when we fail and we watch others fail. That is your grace that is always there for us. And that when we mess up, we can always turn to it. I ask this in our Savior's name, who paid for it all. Amen.